we're all in the same spot. <laughs> so I really apologize. Um, Strange two minutes. Are we live? I really apologize. Okay, so we are live on YouTube now, but unfortunately, it's not the link that I shared earlier. <laughs> So I'll have to fix all that when we're done, but I want to get started. Apologies again. Let me get us going here. Facebook should be fine. All right, I'm going to turn that down. Happy One Wednesday, everybody. Really, really sorry. I'm going to keep jumping back and forth and make sure nobody's in the wrong place on YouTube. When I scheduled it, I had 8.30 instead of 8, so when we went live, I didn't know if it was working. It was just saying it, uh, waiting on me, so apologies. If anybody does miss this, I always make sure there's a video afterwards. Um, so, oh, I'm so sorry. Got to get this technical stuff down right. Um, but anyhow, welcome to Wine Wednesday. Cheers. I'm actually sipping on something different this week. Um, found some old vine Zinfandel. And I'm not a typical, like, white Zinfandel type chick. I like the deep reds. But this deep red is some, is some yummy stuff, just to let you know. So what are you drinking on? Anybody in the comments or anywhere else, let me know. And how is everybody this week? How are you, Holly? Anything new? Good. Okay. Good. I still have some of my babies left. I've got six. <laughs> Nice. Hey, I mean, six is more than zero. Congrats. And you're, you're having success with the peroxide. And the wine. Yeah, I am. I've got one that's probably dying right now, but the ones I've lost are the ones that just never develop. Like they never grew really for gotcha. some reason. And I've got one more that's hanging on, but I expect to be losing him soon. Mm. But the other ones are looking real good. They're getting bigger. Well, that's yeah, awesome. One of the things that can happen with fry, yeah. particularly if it's a young pair, mm -hmm. is the fry will be much smaller and much harder to raise. And I I even got pictures of fry from the same pair 12 months apart. And uh -huh. the difference in these is huge. I mean, they're more yeah. they're like double the size. Yeah, these and, guys are pretty young. This is only their second batch that they've had mm -hmm. yeah so i mean it, Ooh, somebody's got the police. Makes a huge difference gotcha absolutely um and nicole you doing okay this week she might be. i am i still have the same fall from last week so Woo! Fing fingers crossed yes i saw your post too and and congratulated also <laughs> very good um, well, this, we, we love talking fry, as you can see, guys, but this week, actually, we wanted to concentrate on filtration. We had a couple of requests, so we want to definitely hear from you in the audience what works for you, what do you think is important, what has not worked for you, and we'll definitely share within the room and check out comments. But Dan, very of Seahorse Source, was so kind as to prepare um, a few really great answers to these questions before we even get to asking the questions. So, um, Dan, are you ready to uh, perform, so to speak? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Or did you want to do it differently? I guess. <laughs> I'll never be completely ready, so. Gotcha. Well, let me let me make no, you. I'll, ne I'll never be completely ready, so. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I Dan, you. you're always ready. I know, right? Okay, well, do me a favor. Everybody else, um, it, let's mute. Do, if nobody knows how, just hit the um, little microphone at the bottom of your screen to mute and um, so that we can hear what the man is saying. All right, let me go. Okay, so I have you full screen, sir. No, I don't. Hang on. Let me fix it. <laughs> I'm getting it. I've got it on Cheryl. That's why. Okay. You are now full screen, sir, if you would like to. Actually, I mean, I can start it off by saying what's most important, um, you know, what what do people typically not understand about filtration? And that's the main topic for today. Dan, if you'd like to take it away, please feel free. Yes, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the idea here what I wanted to do was to explain filtration so that folks understand the needs in a seahorse tank. Unfortunately, many people 
don't understand what is needed in terms of filtration in a seahorse tank. And as a consequence, the organic loading that happens in a seahorse tank is different than a regular fish tank and they run into problems. And if you, if you don't understand, you may as well be blindfolded. And if you could imagine for a moment being blindfolded, handed a bow and arrow, and spun around three times and, and asked to hit a target, your odds are gonna be pretty low. If on the other hand, you can see the target or understand what the target is, you're gonna have a much better sh shot of hitting it dead on. And that is the whole idea of this presentation. Now, there's, when we talk about filtration, there's really two types of filtration. The first type, of course, is biological. And the second type that I'm going to be focusing on is mechanical. Now, biological filtration, most folks understand, is the aquarium nitrogen cycle. And hopefully, most folks already have an understanding of this if they already have a seahorse tank or tanks in general. Um, waste is produced, uh, ammonia is created, and the nitrogen cycle helps remove that. Um, Mechanical filtration, though, is a lot different. Mechanical filtration removes the waste before it goes through the biological process of nitrification. And um, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you have organic waste in a tank, before it or any other organic matter can go through the nitrification cycle, it must first be eaten and processed into ammonia. And this is critical. A lot of people do not get this. I see it all the time with some of my reefer friends that decide they're going to set up a seahorse tank. And I explain to them, seahorses need more filtration. So they say, well, I'll add more live rock. Live rock is a biological media for the biological cycle. It does nothing for the mechanical cycle. Now, the reason that I go into this is that when we look at seahorses, of course, they're a fish, despite what many people think. But they're very different in many ways. Now, some of these are quite obvious that many of us see and know, but some of them not so much. When you look at fish, fish are able to swallow food, suck it up, eat it, whatever. They, they have a jaw that expands. They can eat food whole. Or in some cases, they have teeth where they grab a hold of things or they just rip them apart. Um, seahorses, on the other hand, have a fixed snout. And if you look at the snout on a seahorse, um, it's fixed. It works like a straw almost, except there's a powerful suction. It draws the food in. It becomes macerated, and that's how they ingest food. And if you look at this video here, in this video, I'm hoping everybody can see it clearly, but if you watch when the seahorses snick the food, watch closely, and out of the operculum, you're going to see what looks like smoke, a plume of smoke. In reality, that's organic matter being ejected back out into the water column. And if you watch this, you'll see that both when they snick the food and when they macerate it, you'll see some coming out of the front, some coming out of the back. And according to a research paper I read, and I wish I could find it, I've lost it, but this papers, they estimated 8% of what a seahorse uh, ingests through the snicking method is ejected through the operculum as waste product. Now, most of this waste, as you look at it, is very, very small, and much of it is too small for the cleanup crew. Um, and this is a critical part of understanding. And the other thing that people should be aware of, if you try to enrich the food that you feed a seahorse, that's going to increase the amount that's ejected out. And I should say, this video, by the way, is made by Montre Bay Aquarium. It's a nice video on the, uh, on the feeding. Um, the seahorses are also different in terms of their digestive system. When you look at a regular fish, regular fish have a pretty sophisticated uh, digestive system where seahorses are very primitive. They've, they've been around for millions of years and they haven't evolved like the rest of the fish have. When food comes in, it comes in and goes to, instead of a true stomach, it's more of an outpouch, outpouch that holds the food as it goes through the digestive system. On a typical fish, when food enters the mouth, it takes anywhere from 24 to 36 hours before it's exited. And much of that is digested. On a seahorse, on the other hand, when they snick in food, it goes through their system and back out in as short of a period of time as 10 hours. Now, what that means is 
is approximately 24% of what they eat is undigested. So when you're looking at their poop, you're looking at a lot of food matter that has not been fully digested. So when we look at the organic waste from feeding and we take 8% of it that's added to the water column from ingestion, 24% from the lack of digestion, that equals 32% or roughly one third of the food that a seahorse eats ends up back into the water column. So one third of the food is back into the water column and much of it too small for the cleanup crew. So the example I like to give people is if you look at a, a, a tank with a pair of seahorses and you're feeding those seahorses a cube of mices every feeding three times a day, that is essentially the same thing as just dropping a cube of mices in the tank and letting it rot. And think for a moment, what would happen, you know, what would you think would happen in a tank if you just let a cube of mices in there just rot away every single day? And that's essentially what's happening in a seahorse tank. Um, and again, before food can be broken down and go through the nitrification cycle, something must eat it first. Now, if we've got a good cleanup crew, they'll eat the larger particles. But when we have a bunch of small particles, um, especially with uh, particles that are dissolved or non-dissolved solids in the water column, that means we're going to have bacteria that are going to feed on. Now, much, much of the bacteria in our tanks, despite what people think, or if I can say it correctly, ubiquitous, in that they're always present. And that includes even Vibrio. Vibrio is in our tanks all the time. But Vibrio can act as a commensal organism where they feed on organics and, and not be a problem when things are in balance and everything is going correctly and there's not too much organics. Um, and that's true of some of the other bacteria as well. We also can have um, protozoans. And the slide here is actually of uh, uranema and that's one of the protozoans that we have to deal with, but they too are also always present in our tanks. When we have high organics, their population grows as well. So we have excess, excess amounts of organics. That means increased microbial activity. Increased microbial activity gets crazy. We end up with all kinds of organisms and then we have problems in the seahorse tank. Now, what kind of problems do we have? Well, the first type of problem we can have is increased oxygen demand in the tank. The more organisms that are in the tank, the more oxygen that is consumed. We can also have a decrease in the oxygen reduction potential. We can also have a decrease in the pH. And of course, we can have seahorse illnesses. Now for illnesses, those can be weak snick, um, tail rot, gas bubble disease, bacterial infections, protozoan or parasitic infections. So logical question is, what is the answer? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can reduce the amount of food added. Now, when I say reduce the amount of food added, I'm not talking about starving the seahorses. What I'm talking about is if you look at a tank that has a lot of seahorses, a lot of food has to be added to that tank. If on the other hand, as in this case, we have a 55 gallon tank with a pair of reed eye in it, the amount of food going in here is much less. So there's a tremendous amount of dilution and there's not as much organics uh, uh, concentrated in the tank. In the example here, this tank was getting a quarter of a pound of food per day. These guys were getting the equivalency of a cube of mices per feeding, which makes a big difference. That's why when you hear me ever recommend how many seahorses to put into a tank, you'll hear me always say one pair for every 25 to 30 gallons. Now, there's a lot of people that will recommend a pair for every 15 gallons. So they'll tell you, you know, first pair of 30 gallons, 15 gallons for each pair thereafter. I'm going to argue that 25 to 30 gallons per pair, period. And I can tell you from experience, I've been doing this since 2003, between the help, uh, the forums, the help desk, talking with the customers. When I look at people who have had the same seahorses for, for five to 10 years or longer, 
there's a common theme. And one of those common themes is they have a light stocking density. Now, can you put more seahorses in a tank? Yes. But I can also tell you that, for example, I've got one customer who keeps eight seahorses in a 55-gallon tank. About every 18 months to two years, he calls me for replacements because he's lost so many. And, you know, I've got other customers that when I talk to them, you know, they're going on five, six, seven, eight. The longest that I have a customer is keeping the same seahorse is 11 years, an H erectus for 11 years in a tank. Dan, I've got um, one question for you real quick on that. When you're saying, uh, and I, the reason I'm asking is I get this question. When you're saying 25 to 30 gallons per pair, does that include the sump or is it just in the tank? My preference is a tank. Now, the sump gives you more volume, but if I've got a 100-gallon sump and a 10-gallon tank, yes. well, I'm going to have a concentration of organics in a 10-gallon tank unless I'm just flushing the crap out of it. And mm -hmm. most people don't have the flow high enough and the filtration scheme good enough to deal with it. So I try to keep it at, at one pair for every 25 to 30 gallons. And you know, uh, the next thing, of course, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm so sorry, Dan. I want I don't mean to interrupt you. Cheryl did, so I felt free. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask because uh, great question, Cheryl. And when you're uh, when you're discussing the the pairs and etc. There's other reasons too for making sure that they have the space in the tank, right? There is, but in this terms, we're talking filtration, and that's where my focus is. Fair enough. I'm shutting up. Go ahead. Okay, so the next thing we can do is have a large cleanup crew. And by a large cleanup crew, I don't mean large, large cleanup crew. I mean <laughs> many smaller for a large cleanup crew, such as Unisaria snails, uh, peppermint shrimp, small hermit crabs, etc. Um, and of course, we can physically remove the waste, and that's done by simply cleaning the tank, siphoning out you know debris that's on the bottom, and just general cleaning of the tank and physically removing the organic matter. And lastly, of course, is mechanical filtration. And by mechanical filtration, here we're talking about using things like cartridge filters, uh, media that's designed to trap and hold uh, particulate matter. Uh, protein skimmers are part of mechanical filtration. And we'll talk more about that as we discuss stuff going forward uh, in the talk. Now, for those of you who want to raise fry, there's a big reason why commercial people have more success than many of the hobbyists. People don't understand this, but just because the fry are little, they still need filtration. And because there's typically a whole bunch of them in a small confined space, they need a much more robust filtration scheme than the adult seahorse tank. Um, real quickly, I want to touch on a couple of other things. And the first one is the UV sterilizer. Uh, a lot of people call it a UV filter. A UV sterilizer is not a filter. It is a clarifier or a sterilizer. And yes, it can help reduce the amount of bacteria and parasites in a tank. However, most people in the hobby world don't set them up correctly. They don't have the right flow for the right dwell time. The, um, um, the quartz sleeve isn't cleaned often enough, and sometimes it's not even the right power or the right uh, flow rate for the given tank. So often people put them in place and have a false sense of security. I will tell you that a UV sterilizer is good to add to a tank. But if I had a, if my budget was tight, I would take the protein skimmer over the sterilizer, just to give you an idea what my thought process is. Um, ozone, you don't see too much in the hobbyist, but ozone will actually oxidize the bacteria and the protozoans, and it also oxidizes organics. And then, of course, there's probiotics. And the thing to remember with probiotics is that probiotics are designed to enhance husbandry, not replace it. So you need to still mechanically remove as much of the organic matter as you can. Um, if you had enough probiotics to eat up that organic matter, um, that would create problems on its own. You can actually put too much probiotics in a tank. Uh, Paula, who is um, the director of husbandry at the Dallas World Aquarium, posted this in the thread when uh, Kelly announced this uh, tonight. 
and I, I couldn't agree more. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's all, folks. Love it. I love Paula. Okay, let me uh, really quickly, because I'm, I'm kind of scooting as we're going here. I'm going to make this back to a little bit smaller. Just a little bit. Push you up here. Sorry, folks that are watching. Got to fix the stuff. And then a little bit less. Almost there. Almost there. You guys can start talking, though. You don't have to wait on me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, go All ahead, right. Cheryl. First, I'll take any questions. Yes. I do have a question for Dan because I use UVs, but I use them strictly for any form of allergy control because I typically am running bare bottoms, so I don't have a lot of plastic uh, allergy eaters or cleanup crew. And I found they work very good, very well for keeping green hair allergy, that kind of stuff down. Uh, but I also run very low flow specifically for for algae i'm not trying to use them for bacteria and i mean have you heard of somebody else doing this before <laughs> one more time i'm sorry i'm trying to make sure i got this correct mm -hmm. uh i do run uvs okay but i use them on very low flow specifically for elimination of nuisance algae in the tank because well, in that case in that case, you're using it as a clarifier. Yes, exactly. So it's still and useful, it but not filtration. it can work for that purpose. It's yeah. used often in swimming pools, right? It's used in swimming pools for that purpose, and sometimes it's used in koi ponds for that purpose. But, you know, it can work either as a clarifier or sterilizer or both. It all depends upon how much power it has, how much mm -hmm. dwell time there is, you know, and, of course, how... Well, everything is one thing that people don't realize is that if I take the most powerful UV filter we have out there and put it on my system and I run it through the correct dwell time, if I don't pre filter that water, bacteria is a fraction of a micron in size. And mm -hmm. a particle that's 15 microns acts like an umbrella so that that bacteria goes right through and doesn't get zapped by the UV and it doesn't kill it. Well, plus so unless you have a pre-filter, you know, you, even if you've got the correct UV, it's still not doing its maximum effectiveness. Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, with the, the bacteria is most of what we have is actually living on substrate, rocks, that kind of stuff. So it's not even going to pass through the UV. So I'm not sure the seahorses would, would, would be a benefit for bacteria. Was there a question in that? Or no? <laughs> okay, everybody got quiet. Um, sure, Oops. was there a question? I, I'm sorry, well, I was trying to listen. Yeah, I'm just thinking that I don't try to use them for bacteria because most of the bacteria that are going to be in a marine tank are going to be living on substrate. So even they're not going to pass through a UV anyway because they're not typically free swimming. Well, a lot of the, that's true of a lot of it, but not all of them are on the substrate. And most of your um, protozoans are going to be swimming around. So in theory, a UV filter is going to help. And it also helps in some other ways because of what the UV does to the water mm -hmm. and how it affects the ORP and some other things. But that's, that gets in pretty deep. And I still can't wrap my head around how it all works. <laughs> or it, or if it's... Sorry, go ahead. I have a lot less problem with algae because I keep them very low flow and I'm running them through specifically for algae control. Because I mean, obviously in my bare bottoms, I don't have turbo snails and neither in my nurseries and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm really curious too, anybody who's watching or anybody in the room, do you guys use UV sterilizers? Because I know, uh, I do, just, just for the record, not on every tank, but on the big important tanks, like the reef and the big seahorse tank, I do. And um, in a previous Wine Wednesday, Kevin brought up the fact um, that it's important where you put that in the procession of filtration, like before or after skimmers and stuff like that makes a big difference. And as Dan pointed out, the, the rate of power to the UV matters also, like the flow rate through it. Um, so do you guys, do you, does anyone in here use UV sterilizers? 
No, I don't. I thought, Marina, you do, don't you? No, I don't, but it is oh. something I'm looking at adding. Okay. Well, then I guess me and Cheryl are the only ones. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, we, you, uh, anyone else can ask any questions. Great presentation, though, Dan. And for anyone that, uh, you know, got came in halfway because of the mix-up with the time, I'll be sure to repost at least that segment um, and that time, this time there's volume, so I'll actually do it. I promise. Um, but we taught, so Dan has kind of showed us why filtration is important and the basics on, you know, what, what we need to do and et cetera. Can, can you cover Dan? Um, like when you, you covered mechanical filtration mainly, um, but can you go into a little bit like why we need an oversized sterilizer? I mean, uh, you not sterilizer, skimmer, sorry, and why maybe, you know, those types of things are important. I know you covered it basically in your presentation, but I mean, do you have anything to add about particular things like that? Well, well Salty's question was about using a protein skimmer that was oversized. And yes. Yes, Salty, I do like using an oversized protein skimmer on a seahorse tank, and I also run it on the wet side. And I find that, you know, when I buy a skimmer and it says it's rated for X amount of gallons of tankage, I usually find that I want something two to three times that size of what they rate it for, for a typical seahorse tank, because of how much I'm pulling out of the water. And it's not just clear stuff. I mean, it's downright yucky. And so I do believe in running an oversized skimmer. And I also want to point out one thing I didn't cover in the presentation when it comes to biological filtration, and that is when people first set up a seahorse tank, think about it for a minute. A lot of people believe in just throwing some food in the tank, letting it rot, letting that start the cycle. But if you go back to the pretense of what I said, that organic matter must be eaten before it can go through nitrification, yeah. in essence, what you're doing is you're increasing the microbial activity in the tank sometimes to the negative side by just throwing food in there and letting it cycle. That's why I believe in using ammonia directly for cycling and not food. Well, yeah, we're not supposed to, I mean, one of the things that you say a lot and every, all of us say a lot is to not leave any kind of food on the bottom, not because, I mean, not just because it's overly, it's going to add to the organics, but also doesn't that like attract the, the, or, or make the bad bacteria grow faster and like ciliates and all that, doesn't that occur because of sitting food? It increases well, your bacteria yeah. load. Yeah. And protozoan. Yeah. Um, and you got to remember, you know, if you start with a sterile tank, completely sterile, and you throw, a, say, you know, a large shrimp in the tank and just let it rot and let that be your, your method of cycling, something is eating that tank and the bacteria are going to populate the protozoans are going to populate, and in most instances, it comes out okay. But you started off by increasing your uh, microbial activity, whereas if you use pure ammonia, there's no microbial activity to feed on that ammonia. That ammonia is going straight to the biological bacteria that are going to uh, populate the, that tank. The, the commensal organisms that eat organics aren't going to really populate until there's food. They don't eat ammonia. They, well, in some cases, some of the, the Vibrio do eat ammonia, but for the most part, they they primarily eat organic matter. So by using ammonia I, to cycle, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Nicole. I was going to say I made that I made that mistake, and I then I talked to you, Kelly. About the whole thing, I threw in a raw shrimp because somebody said to do that to cycle my tank. Before I found everybody on here, and it was a nightmare. It took, I think, it took my tank probably two times longer to cycle than any other normal tank because I did that. Sure, and I, uh, I actually talked about it in a video, but it's a really long video. So, just very briefly, um, Dan, do you, can you like? I never say it exactly properly when you tell people to use ammonia to cycle the tank. What exactly do you mean? Well, there's there's a couple different ways of doing this. I mean, you could contact Dr. Timms, and he's got a whole setup that you can follow that cycles the tank. But you can also buy, you know, crystal, crystallized ammonia that you can add to the tank, ammonium, ammonium crystals, 
But the easiest way is to simply buy a very cheap, uh, clear, unscented household ammonia. And the way that I cycle a tank is a lot different than a lot of other people do it. And that is, I add ammonia till I reach one part per million. And one part per million in almost any given tank is going to be enough to handle the bio load of what you're going to put in that tank. Mm-hmm. And I can look at my notes and explain it out further, but um, one part per million. And then I wait until that ammonia disappears. I wait until the nitrites come up and then the nitrites start to go down before I add more ammonia. Now, most people, as soon as ammonia goes down, they add more ammonia. The problem with that is, is that the molecular weight between ammonia and nitrite is different. Nitrite is 2.7 times higher. So one milligram or one part per million of ammonia is going to turn into 2.7 parts per million of nitrite. So people keep adding of ammonia and the nitrites get way up there before the cycle completes. And what happens is, is it stalls. It takes longer to cycle the tank because the nitrites are so high, they almost become toxic. Mm -hmm. And by waiting until the nitrites cycle, then adding ammonia again, it's going to speed up. Because the the nitrosomas bacteria that eat the ammonia will replicate roughly every eight hours. They'll double. But the bacteria, the nitrobacter that eats the nitrite will take anywhere from 12 to 17 or 18 or even longer hours before they will double. So not only does the ammonia almost turn into three times the amount of nitrite, but it takes twice as long for them to catch up. So I wait until the nitrites come down, then I add ammonia again, again to one part per million. And each time I do that, the period that it takes for it to go through that cycle will decrease in time. And I have started before with a completely bare system and cycled it as little as two weeks using that method without adding bacteria. Couple, now, it doesn't always happen that way, but it, it does work much faster than waiting for that super high nitrites to come down. Gotcha. Do, do you see a decrease uh, in the cycling or decrease in the cycling process if you're using like K1 media reactors that are already cycled? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Cheryl. She, I, I was, I'm, Cheryl, I'm, I was going to... I was going to ask the same kind of question, Dan. Um, a, a lot of in the video, it confused a lot of people, and I get a lot of questions about pre-cycling media that you can use to cycle a tank. How do you feel about that? Uh, does that work? For instance, you yourself have put up a tank in a day because you have cycled media there and waiting, but that's not exactly the same as taking a sock from a different sump. So, right thoughts. Right. So, in some cases. Um, well, in my case, I actually used to have two uh, containers that had media in it that I fed ammonia to it on a regular basis so that I had media that was pre-cycled and ready to go. So on these containers, I would add ammonia to them virtually every day. And when I needed to set up a tank, I would bleach the system. I would tear everything down that I needed to torn out of it, all the removable parts, including the media. And then I would dechlorinate it, and then I would add water, and I would add the media that was already pre-cycled to it and load it with fish and go. Yep. Now, I, I've also done it by adding bacteria. Yep. The problem with buying bacteria and adding it to a tank, quite often, you know, even the best ones on the market, almost all of them are very good at converting the ammonia, but I've had, even from the best, I've had some where the nitrite part of it lag and when you're starting off with when you're loading a system heavily it's difficult if you've got to sit there and fight with the nitrobacter not being up to par so another i I tell you i do like using live bacteria Mm -hmm. but it's expensive and it's not always reliable gotcha i just wanted to add really quickly that the, the, the description you gave of adding ammonia not every day when you're cycling media or a tank, um, it's, that's actually exactly what Dr. Tim says on his website. And I, I fully will always defend Dr. Tim's um, cycling bacteria and uh, products. However, 
I, speaking to Dr. Tim himself at MACNA um, many times, wonderful experience, by the way, but uh, he explained to me that what happens a lot of times is, you know, they sell the product, they have expiration dates on it, um, but if the people shipping the product, if the people selling the product don't keep it in the conditions it needs to be kept in, sometimes you buy it and it's not, um, you know, it, it's not alive anymore because it shouldn't have been sold in the conditions it was sold in. So it's definitely always a risk. I buy it direct. And I just wanted to mention that he does talk about the ammonia um, on different dates. He actually gives you on day three, do this, on day seven. I can try to link that when we're done. Um, but Dan, uh, and then guys, I'll shut up and let you guys ask questions too. But I get the question a lot of times when you're talking about cycling a tank, not a full system like a breeder, not like pre-cycled media, but when you tell people to cycle the tank with ammonia, do you need to, is that, is it okay if there's cleanup crew in there already? No. Okay. So you need well, to do this. So, so, some cleanup crew will survive, but you're going to put them through undue stress. Um, so in theory, you want to have your tank cycled before you add your cleanup crew. Um, and, you know, a lot of people like to use, you know, it's, it'd almost be like taking the idea of putting a hardy fish in there that can handle the ammonia and cycling the tank with the fish. Right. It's not fair to the animals to do that. What, well, I guess what I was kind of getting at is that if, if and Nicole, I want to say, the reason I know all of this is because Dan taught me because I made the same mistakes. So don't feel bad ever. Um, we all have, that's just how we learn is by sharing with each other. But if you're in a position where you've made the mistake of cycling in a way that some reefer told you was okay, you're not in a position to use ammonia. What do you suggest then? Um, I know that's getting I off the Right. I suggest buying bacteria. That's what I would say, too. Okay. Back to filtration. You know, the problem is this. You know, if we go back to the shrimp idea where you're dumping organic, the nice thing about using the, back, the ammonia method is that it's controlled. When you dump a shrimp in there and wait for it to decay and wait for something to eat it, convert it to ammonia, you have no control, at number one. So your ammonia levels can go way up there. And number two, you still don't know if the tank is ready. And by ready, you know, when we use the method where we where I use one part per million, you know, you take any given tank, um, let's take a 50 gallon tank, one part per million, well, that's gonna be roughly what, 400, um, 200 liters. So that tank is, if we cycle it one part per million, it's gonna handle 200 milligrams of ammonia per day. A cube of mices, when you calculate it out, will generate about 27 milligrams of, of ammonia. So if you're feeding three cubes a day, you're feeding roughly less than 100 milligrams of ammonia to the tank, but the tank is cycled to handle 200 milligrams. Exactly. People don't realize, you know, don't realize they're going to be feeding more, so it has to kind of be cycled more because of the waste and, you know, it's... Well, kind of well, the, well, the point I'm making is that it's measured so you know that you're able to hit your target. Absolutely. Okay, before I ask my next question, um, did anybody else in the room and jump to comments, do you, did you guys have any other questions about what we're talking about or his presentation? I do have a question about that because okay. I've heard of that method, but I don't know much about it. So when you're talking about cycling with actual ammonia, would you do this with nothing but water in the tank and then add like live rock and other things? You could, but no, I, if, if I'm going to be using live rock, I want to go ahead and put the live rock in the tank because the live rock is going to be part of my media to hold the beneficial bacteria. Okay. And the same thing with the sand. I want the sand, the live rock, basically the decor put in the tank. Now, okay. I would probably hold off on adding things such as my life Your plants cleanup. and my cleanup crew and those type of things, but the rest of the stuff I'm going to go ahead and put in the tank. Okay, because I did mine. I used live rock and live sand and bacteria. Yeah, like we were talking about earlier. And I like the ammonia method. I think next time I might try that. The you just have to be patient. You know, the ammonia method is very, very um, good. It works. It's predictable. It's very mm -hmm. efficient, but it's not instantaneous. And sometimes bacteria, adding bacteria can be instantaneous if it works correctly. Sometimes you still have to go through a little bit of a cycling process. No, mine was not instantaneous. It, it took a while before I added anything. 
but I mean, it did work. Another point. Using, oh, like, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the problem with using live rock also, and I've run into this with a number of people, is they go out and buy live rock at the local fish store. And the next thing they know, they've got flatworms. They're finding crabs that they didn't know were hiding in the rocks. You can introduce a whole lot of unwanted stuff into a tank unless you've mm -hmm. sterilized it before you turned it into live rock. There's definitely well, arguments. I have used rock in tanks. And when I use rock in tanks, I sterilize it. And then I put it's nice, pretty white rock when I put it in the tank. Mm -hmm. But during my cycling process, I'll put it in the tank and let it come back becoming live rock over a period of time. There's definitely arguments for and against using live rock or dry rock. Um, seahorse keepers, I just tend to notice mostly use dry because the hitchhikers and the possibilities are so much uh, worse. You know, like in a reef tank, you don't, the live rock actually can be a better way to do it in certain cases, but seahorse tanks, you're, you know. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask before we move on, Dan, is um, I get a lot of questions about keeping pre-cycled media. We already discussed it, but I did want you to just uh, talk through very briefly, like you can't just, actually there are some types of media at this point. I think Brightwell um, has a brick that they say can just sit and you know continue to be cycled or whatever. But what we're talking about is typically uh, K1 or moving media. So do you need to keep it continually under flow and when you're if you're adding ammonia out all you know to feed it constantly now and then every week or so um when you go to actually use it is that when you test and make sure that it passes all your tests go ahead okay you got a couple of know. questions mixed in at one <laughs> That's how i do it um the first question is it doesn't matter to me what the media is okay I happen to use K1 media, but you could be using the Brightwell. You could be using bio balls. You could be using rock. You could have a, a big tub full of rock that you're adding ammonia to. Um, there's any enough. It doesn't matter as long as you've got circulation so that the uh, biological uh, bacteria gets oxygen. The nitrifying bacteria, excuse me, are getting the oxygen they need and the food that they need. Then it's going to continue to go. So you're going to have to have circulation in there regardless of what product you put in there. Um, the other thing is while you're doing that, you should also make sure that you watch your pHs on those type of systems because nit the nitrifying bacteria consume buffers during the nitrification process. And that's why in commercial uh, fishing where we have high densities, we're constantly adding buffer because of the nitrification. Um, now, your other question was, uh, I'm sorry, I got the first part. What was the second part? Uh, the second part was uh, you, you did make the uh, case that you, to keep it cycled, you don't just cycle it and then let it sit because it has to continue to, to be fed. Yes, um, uh, right. You said putting it in the system and testing it, okay? Yes. And that's a great point. And what happens is, is that I'll give you an example of what I do. Um, in theory... I got things in such a way that I put up a system and before I put the fish in it, I add the ammonia to the system based upon the gallons of how much I want to get to one part per million and test it to verify that it's going to cycle all the way through before I add the fish. And so in theory, if that happens, then I'm ready to add the fish. Reality is, is often I'm pushed to where I just have to add the fish anyway and I'm checking it after the fact and then playing catch up if it's not fully cycled with water changes or adding bacteria or whatever. Do you stand, uh, I, I know I usually keep at least one tank and stuff that is totally unoccupied and I use that to cycle K1, uh, rock, whatever else I need. And so I always have a continuous supply if something goes wrong of cycled me, media on hand. And I just I hit it and test it with, with pure ammonia on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, just, maybe it's just me and I'm crazy. <laughs> You're not crazy, I'm so, lady. Well, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, Cheryl. What is the question, though? Okay. Basically, I have a tank and sump system that I have, and that is specifically only for cycling, keeping filter media cycles. Right. And I have rock in there. I have K1. and Sure. 
and basically if there's an emergency or something i've already got some pre-cycled built on right and is that a good idea i mean that that's what i've been doing for no. years well i think it really depends upon the hobbyist and the setup and what they're trying to achieve you know if you've got a display tank and all you have is a pair of seahorses and you don't plan on raising fry you don't right. plan on doing anything else but maintaining that tank you really don't need to have anything else on standby yeah. on the other hand if you've got multiple seahorse tanks and you're you're one of these people who joined a hobby with the intent of having a seahorse tank and now you got six of them and you're thinking about adding two more and now you're going to save the fry well now you better have some cycle media on hand yeah. if you want to be johnny on the spot and dealing with stuff so it really depends upon you know the hobbyist and what they're they're doing yeah um you know it's it's an addictive hobby some people find that they get into it next thing you know one tank turns into to x amount others and Sure. <laughs> then, it is, then it's very nice to have the cycle media on hand. Um, on, on the other hand, if you're not going to raise fry and you're not going to have a bunch more tanks and you only got the one tank, there really is no need. Okay. Oh, one. I, it just, I always find it funny because people will start out with a one tank and a small tank and then they move up to a 50 and then they're looking at a hundred and then they're bringing in more, other multiple tanks for seahorses and it just, it's like the whole thing keeps snowballing on them. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. the, I, see, I keep seeing all these uh, comments. I do see your comments. We will get your questions, I promise. And uh, Dan, did you want to respond? Because I had one last question about this stuff. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, okay. The last question was because, um, you know, we talk about this stuff, and then somebody who hasn't done this before kind of listens to us and says, wait what's k1 we're not going to go into all that detail it's a filter media i can tell you if you want to message me but bottom line is when you're going to whether you have pre-cycled media or you have live rock or whatever you have what is your recommendation about how much to use meaning they have you know one or two two pounds per gallon in the reef world or whatever it is i that's not it guys i'm just talking off my head here but they have rules or regular recommendations about how much you need to put in. And you have made the case very greatly that it's more about making sure that whatever you've used can handle the ammonia. But do you have any thoughts or recommendations or do you just say use the ammonia? Well, the amount of media that's needed um, for your biological filtration when I'm using K1 media, I can actually sit down and do the math because there's a formula that they tell you how much it, it will handle. Um, so I can sit down and mathmat mathematically calculate out how much K1 media I need for X amount of pounds of food. Realistically, in a home aquarium, that's not going to happen that way. Right. So you can start off with using what you think you want for media and through the cycling process, if it handles the ammonia through that process, then it's enough. If it, if it never finishes the cycle, then you don't have enough. And what I will tell you is that what I find is, is that when I'm cycling a tank, if I've got excess amount of a media, more, of biological media, more than what I need, the tank cycles faster. Mm -hmm. And when I'm helping customers that are using things like a bio wheel, for example, let's take an Emperor 400. You know, you got a bio wheel with a small area that allows a high density of, of bacteria. That will cycle, but it will take much longer because it's a smaller surface area. If I've got a much larger surface area, it will cycle faster than a small area. Gotcha. Okay, well, um, Guys, did you have any other questions about it? I, I keep seeing, I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted by the comments. So um, do you guys have, anybody in the room have any other questions about his presentation, about the, you know, the biological and mechanical filtration? Anybody? I saw we had another joiner. And I want to my One quick question, because oh. I know what I do. Dan, do you use filter socks? I'm sorry, do I use what? Filter socks. I... Yes, I use filter socks on all my tanks. Okay. Now, a filter sock is a form of mechanical filtration. Yeah. And when I look at filter socks, I, I highly recommend them on seahorse tanks for the sump. 
because it will catch the majority of the bigger stuff if you use the right sock. And I use 100 microns. I've tried yeah. using 50s, but the 50s clog up so fast that I had to go back to the 100 microns. Yeah, I and use I use a netting type material as opposed to a glass mat type material. Mm -hmm. And um, they will catch you know everything that's 100 microns or larger. Mm -hmm. And um, I much prefer that over blue bonded media or some other type of media to catch the stuff. It's very easy to change them out. They're very easy to clean. Yeah, I just I, I bleach and wash them and use them again. <laughs> hey, I just actually noticed, Sam, I didn't realize that it was you that joined. Welcome, Sam. Did you have, I, I heard you try to talk. You're, you're one of those light speakers, so I'm going to call you out and say, <laughs> did you have anything you wanted to ask or add as far as what's important when it comes to filtration? Um, no, nothing serious. I'm thankfully sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sam. It's early morning here. No, it's not really. It's nearly midday. Um, <laughs> so good. No, I think Dan's pretty well covered. It doesn't really matter what the media is. It's more a matter of if it's going to convert the ammonia that you want. And if you've got sand in your tank, you're pretty well going to have the surface area to carry the biological filtration you need anyway. Actually, that's a great point. For those of us in the room that are keeping beer bottom tanks, how does how does that affect? We're, I'm just talking strictly biological filtration at this point. Well, um, obviously, you'd need more uh, yeah. rock or media in your sump to, you know, so you've still got the adequate number of bacteria. Absolutely. And so we've. I, I have a couple other questions. Um, but we've covered why both biological and mechanical are important. What kinds of, you know, we mentioned using an oversized skimmer. We mentioned the filter socks. We talked about UV, some are for and against. Is there anything else, anybody, um, that is, you feel is a really important part of your filtration system, even at home, that we haven't talked about thus far? What, what, Sam? You and Cheryl are talking at the, at the same time. So Sam, S A M. No. Sam, go for it. A refugium can be a relative. Refugium. That was one of my questions is can anybody speak to how macroalgae can be used or an algae scrubber or a refugium, how that can be used and how that fits into the filtration scheme? Dan, you don't use macroalgae, right? I have in the past at times, and I'll tell you that I really like the idea of an algae scrubber more so than macroalgae. Um, but it really works more towards the ammonia, the nitrites, and the nitrates than it does to the organics. Right. So, um, and, and also, it's a, a good place for microfauna to also populate, which is really good to have in a seahorse tank. They help ecocytes as well. So, it's just a, a really good population of amphipods. You will get some organic detritus be consumed by them in there, and they'll cycle through to feed the seahorses too. So, you know, there's more benefits than just the, the nitrate management as well. I agree, and I do think that there's a tremendous advantage of adding an algae scrubber to any system. Um, oh, I agree with that, too. Yep. Well, I like the refugiums also, but go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Were you going to say something else, Dan? Well, a, re a refugium itself set up with the, you know, the, the plants and the, and the uh, various different organisms in there will help lower some of your larger particulate matter, but you still have to deal with the... the the microscopic dissolved and non-dissolved organics. So oh, from a mechanical right. standpoint, you still got a filter, but it, it does help take some of that out and it does help feed them. And, you know, it's just like, you know, if you looked at it, what would be an ideal system? There was a study done back in the nineties where a clam farmer was using, breeding seahorses and clams and the clams are filter feeders. So he's running the seahorses on one side and filtering the water through the clams. And in a reef tank, what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of those organisms in a reef tank are filter feeders. So 
the dynamics of what happens in a reef tank versus a seahorse tank are much different because of that. A smaller amount of yeah. organics and you got filter feeders. Well, clams are noted to really help clean stuff up, but they're definitely not wanted in a seahorse tank. Well, and Cheryl, Some but you, sorry. I never mean no, to no, over talk. No, no, the other way around. They'd be good to put their filter feeders and take the particular matter out of a seahorse tank, whereas in the reef tank, you want that to be a coral machine. So you're saying it'd be better, it, uh, I think she said a clam. A clam would be good? Yeah, what Dan just explained with yeah. the clams being used to filter the water for seahorses, you don't want that in a reef tank because your your corals want the small particulate food. Gotcha. So it's make the water too clean for a reef tank, where it's perfect for a seahorse tank because you want all the help you can get to clean the water. That's what you mean, Dan, yes? Yeah. Well, clam clams are great for filtering the water, but... I don't like them in the seahorse tank itself because of... No, no, in the sump or something like that. You know? Right. If they're in a refugium or the sump, that's great. But a seahorse will invariably try to wrap its tail around something and a clam will shut and you'll have a problem with the seahorse with the tail. Oh, yeah, or lay on it or, you know. Yeah, Absolutely. Seahorses are like that. A barrel of monkeys. Yes, for sure, monkey tails. And Cheryl, I just wanted to add, too, that... One of the things that I always worried about with, uh, you know, Dan's talked about he'd prefer a scrubber, but I like the macros. I just think they're pretty and I like them um, and, you know, the benefits and all that. But the one thing that I did have problems with when I first started up was hitchhikers. And you've talked before, but, I mean, you have a pretty strict um, way of quarantining them first before you add them to a tank to make sure that they don't have hitchhikers and then they can do their job, right? Cheryl? Yes, I'm sorry, I stepped back. Repeat oh, that. I'm so sorry. I was just going to have you really quickly say um, your quarantine method for macros. Easy way to say it. Uh, my what method? Oh, quarantine. quarantine. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm paranoid. So if it comes in the house, and whether macro, snails, anything like that, they're going to be in quarantine for six months. Mm -hmm. If it's fish coming in from another source, they will probably never see a tank that already has some of my seahorses in it, regardless of the source. It's, from my perspective, it's just not worth taking a chance. I mean, even macro, years ago, I got some um, polypro prolifera, and the next thing I know, I've got um, aptasia. And I, it, it's easier to prevent it than to deal with it. That's yep. my thing. Yep, like Dan said in his presentation, one ounce of prevention is pound of cure. Absolutely. And I just, I, I just see a lot of people also like the macros because it's the natural look. You know, it looks more natural and pretty versus yellow chains and whatever. So it definitely depends on what your focus and goal is. But I think that they can be beneficial. My, my absolute favorite tank right now is the one that has an algae scrubber going because I just don't have to do much. I know Ray would say the same. Speaking of Ray, I, I want to try to, anybody can ask anything, um, but I know if he were here, when you were giving your presentation, Dan, he would have mentioned when you were talking about cleanup crew and adding them and them being a part of the process, he, he likes to make the point often that cleanup crew sometimes isn't what people think because everything they eat and clean up, they poop right back out. So thoughts? Well, what they're doing, though, is they're converting the organic matter into, they're, they're converting it where if they didn't do it, then the bacteria and the protozoans would be doing it. So the more that they eat, the less that the bacteria and the protozoans have to feed on. The problem is what most people don't realize in a seahorse tank is how much of it is microscopic or very fine uh, organic matter. And a cleanup crew will eat the big stuff, but the, the dissolved and non-dissolved organics that are floating around the water column are going to be open game for the bacteria and the protozoa. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, and the thing is, if you don't have a high flow in there, all that the larger particles are just going to collect on the bottom of the tank. And if you don't maintain that tank religiously, you know, that, it's a that, mess. That's a, that's a very great point because if you go back in time, when I first started this hobby back way back in 2003, 
everybody was talking low flow on a seahorse tank. And the reality is we want the flow strong enough that we keep these organic uh, stuff in the water column so that the mechanical filtration can filter them out. Okay, so, and the higher the turnover of the flow, the more we can filter. So, in theory, what we really want is a high flow tank to, to remove as much of the organics as fast as possible. The reality is, depending upon the setup, is how fast we can do that. Some people are very creative. They're able to break up the flow in such a way they can have the high flow, but low current, if you will, and do a quick turnover of the tank. But most people have a very simplified system, so they can't run as high of a flow. Yeah, I typically run, I typically have my UV, I have my main pump, which typically has two returns, and I run wave makers in my tanks, in my seahorse tanks. I typically run higher flow than a lot of my reaper friends with full blown reef tanks with wow. tanks, tanks and groupers and all kinds of stuff. And it amazes me how much lower their flow is compared to what I'm doing in my seahorse. And I know they're all shocked every time. Hey, Ken Wilson, I wanted to mention um, the algae scrubber would have, I mean, I, I don't know of anyone who's done it in tank. I think there's some hang on um, type situations for more of a refugium setting, but I'll, I'll take, I've posted before, but I'll do a post when we're done or try to find a video I made or something. Mine is actually was handmade for me by Ronald Chinners, <laughs> a good, very good friend. And he handmade it for me, he was, worked with plastics and such. And so mine has like two angled slides so I can repeat one a, or replace and harvest one a week. But it does act, act, you know, it does go in the sump. It's a piece that was put into the sump. And when you do talk scrubbers, I just want to also throw out there that um, harvesting is the point. The algae isn't really doing anything. Well, it is, but it, it's not doing what you want it to do unless you're removing it and, you know, letting it regrow. So um, just thought I'd mention that. Um, I I have actually had an algae scrubber in the tank. <laughs> you have? Okay. Tell me. How? Well, when we had our misfit tank, we had uh, seahorses that for one reason or another, we wouldn't sell them because there was some type of either a congenital defect or we had treated them or something. They were healthy mm. otherwise. So instead of putting them down, we put them in what we called our misfit tank. Well, because it was the lowest priority tank, it was the last tank to be to get maintenance. And as a consequence, over a period of time, uh, we got behind on the maintenance and algae started growing in the tank and we just let it go. And that tank was covered with hair algae from one end to the other. And the seahorses absolutely loved it. Oh, and yeah. would, once a week, we would siphon out a crap load of, al of hair algae. And by the next week, it'd all be back. But the, the parameters in the tank were rock stable. The seahorses loved it. It looked ugly as hell. But it was a very effective system. Don't I, just, I have a question. Questions about algae. Yes, I, I saw one from the. Yes, Nicole, you go, and then I have one from the comments too. I'm so sorry. No, um, you no. Yeah. No, my main display has become so disgusting with algae. I can't even stand to look at it. I've tried everything, from vibrant to. Yep. I don't even know. <laughs> I've tried a lot of things. Uh, no chemicals, like chemical, te techni te technically chemical, but I I don't even know what to do. Um, I set up my tank beginning of December, so I know it's a new tank technically, right. but it's so obnoxious. I can't even stand looking at it. What type just, of algae? They, my my seahorses don't care. Like they're happy. No, they don't. They just are they like don't. whatever. That's yeah. cool. Let's do you, this. But I can't stand to look at it. However, I to, can say that I used to have like an arc with my um with my live rock, it, which started as dry rock, but it started. I mean, I I shaped it as an arc, and then I separated it all and made it like a landscape. And maybe I change it back because I think that maybe my flow has been oh, disrupted. I don't know. I don't know, but it's ugly. Actually, I heard my Sam... My don't care, but they, 
part of the I know. I, oh, no, I know. That's how my, that's how my, you don't see my tanks very often because I'm letting them go oh natural lightly because it's too much darn work. I hear you. I feel you. Um, and Sam actually, actually Farah's question in, in the uh, comments was directed towards this because she wants to know how to deal with green hair algae. And Sam, I believe, just asked what type of algae you're seeing, Nicole. Is it hair? Is it uh, slimy? I don't is know it... if it's Briopsis or if it's hair algae. I think it's one or the other, but I I can't even, like, I tried every, and then I tried fluconazole, and then I thought one of my seahorses is not tolerating that well, so then I was like, it's gone. So I did a huge water change. I put the charcoal, you know, like the carbon back in, and it was, I was done with that after, like, two days. Sure. I, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want, is, oh, go ahead. I, I want to. I want to let Dan and Sam. They are both trying to answer, and I cut them both off. Sorry. I just wanted to mention before they start is that you'll find, and I can't wait to hear Sam's answer, especially because you'll find that often certain algae will thrive more under high flow. <laughs> Unfortunately, so uh, Dan first, and then Sam. Go ahead, Dan. Um, with it, with it tank that has a lot of algae, a lot of people think because they've done a large water change, that's sufficient. In reality, what has to happen is, is that you've got to do multiple scrubbings with multiple large water changes to get it under control. Now, the ideal way to deal with this would be to add an algae scrubber. And what happens is with the algae scrubbers you, is you encourage the algae to grow in one place specifically and then you'll find it reduces in the areas where you don't want it. Not all systems are conducive to adding an algae scrubber, but if you have a sump in a place where you can put one, it can make a huge difference in controlling the algae by Out -competing. focusing on where the algae grows. I, I, I mean, I did so much research, but I don't have even a sump, so. Okay. Well, there is such a I, thing as a hang I on the back taking... algae scrubber, Oh, but okay. they're, they're, they are Go expensive, ahead. but um, Santa Monica is one of the guys who makes them that sells them. Um, but they do make uh, hang on the back, or you could fabricate it yourself, mm -hmm. hang on the back algae scrubbers. Santa Monica actually uh, supported us at the, um, oh, what's the name of it, Dan? The event you spoke at. Uh, uh, MBI. MBI. Thank you. Sorry. They actually supported us and provided a um, scrubber as a prize. And I'm I'm like 99% sure that they have the type of system also that you can literally hook up without a sump. Like it goes through it. It works like it's supposed to, but it's not. You don't have to worry about actually making all the attachments and all that crap for an, a full sump. So you, you give it an optimal home yeah. there and it, it all grows there. One of the things, though, do you, if you have, there's a big difference between trying to get rid of bryopsis right. and trying to get rid of the regular green hair algae. Green hair algae is basically, it looks like grass. It has one stem or one piece that comes out. Bryopsis, if you look at it very closely and get out a magnifying glass, it actually has multi pieces coming off, uh, almost like a tree. Yeah. And bryopsis is next can be very, very difficult to, to get rid of once it gets in a tank. I and agree, and that's why I, I really think it is bryopsis, and that's why I tried the fluconazole. But yeah. one of my female, my big female, was not tolerating it very well, oh. the fluconazole, which mm -hmm. I, I've been told that takes care of it no matter what. She was not tolerating it, so I was like, two days later, I did a water change. I put the carbon back in. That was it. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I could actually walk you through, because I had to do something. It wasn't algae that was the problem. It was actually Aptasia that got really bad and really out of control. But there, I could, I could literally walk you through a method of taking out half the stuff, really, truly treating it outside of the tank. But it's a big pain, so the, my first suggestion would be to post a picture and get an ID. Um, if you don't know where, I, do I it. Did. I, oh, okay. I actually pulled, yeah. I pulled out every piece of rock I had and kept it in old pink water and like, scrubbed it. Uh, and it's and well, it I actually had to treat. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually had to like take but, half the rock out and treat it um, separately, and it's a big pain. Also, so that's what I'm saying. Get I have a ID question: first. If anybody's gone well, from a, the, the a sand is, bottom to a bare bottom, because I really almost want to pull my sand out. Could the sand be affecting, affecting it, guys? The sand. 
it it is affecting i i don't think that that's a cause by any means but can i take a sand bottom tank and turn it into a bare bottom tank because my sand i feel like even though it's not the cause of the problem it contributes right it's it, containing. It, it's still growing more. Yeah, it's contributing more. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know how else to say it. I'm sorry. No, perfect. <laughs> Do you guys, can she go from uh, sanded to bare bottom? I think yeah. she could, like, but probably let, it's um. You may need to uh, add more medium, but absolutely you can go from sand to bare bottom. And Marina, I wanted to hear what you were saying. Go ahead. Um, it was just a couple things. With sand, you can... Um, you can remove it. It's just I would be trying really hard to replace maybe with something like Marine Pure or AMS Block. Um, sort of replace a little bit of the surface area that you're taking out by removing the sand and doing it quite slowly. Because your sand is probably over half of your sort of surface area. And taking all that out in one hit can be kind of destabilizing for the tank. And you don't want to sort of make swings happen. Sure. So in other in other words, as some couple people have said in the comments as well, yes. you don't want to remove all the sand at one time. You want to do it slowly, um, not all at once. And, and is there more. something else I can put in tank Thank because you. I don't have a sump? Is there something else I can put into the tank to replace yes. that surface area? You can put more well, air in your filter. You must have a canister filter, yes? Are you using canister, Nicole, or um, hang on back? No, uh, everything, everything is hang on back on my on my tank. Uh, you can put media in your filter, so you can increase your media that way. Yeah, I do. I have, I have like bio pellets, and I also have, obviously, I have, right now I have, um, sorry. Uh, Purigen? Lots of words. Do you use Purigen? Uh, yes. Okay, yes, because I like detergent. Okay. Sorry. No, that's thank okay. you. <laughs> but, but you could also add rock to the tank itself, and that right. would help too. I do. I have quite a bit of rock, so I'm hoping. I just want to rearrange the rock because I feel like my tank was doing better as far as flow. When my tank, I had like an, an arch and everything, and then I separated all the rocks. Oh, man. Well, yeah. I, re I really was, feel like you're headed. not smart. I feel I feel as if you're headed for a sump because I just recommend it. But for uh, anybody who's Listen, about to the talk, the second I can talk my my husband into my I hear you twenty gallon tank, it's happening. I, I hear you, I hear you. But in the meantime, um, I think I think that Dan maybe Sam was going to say something else. But um, anybody have a suggestion? If she can't add a sump. And, you know, she wants to fix this problem. Kim actually mentioned in the comments that she's really worried because she's feeding so much more in the situation she's in. And with just this extra feedings of seahorses, um, what what can you do in this position if you can't add a scrubber or some? Obviously, we've said add more media. Um, does anybody have any suggestions for particular media? More or changes. Well, something, um, something that I think gets really overlooked is actually using corals as part of your filtration, mm. especially things like um, leathers, star polyps, more stuff that grows pretty quickly. They actually take up a lot of the excess nutrients and things like um, even just the waste from seahorse, seahorses is perfect coral nutrition. Great point. Yes, filter, and filter, filter feeders. Yep, and I was going to say... back to the clam idea. So sorry. She didn't have the sump, though. And so I was going to say that, Nicole... Uh, more, more water changes. Sam, Sam is saying more water changes for sure. And I just wanted to mention macros um, in the tank don't work as well because they're not out-competing and they're, you're, not, you're not using the really fast-growing hair algae that's on a scrubber or whatever. But my macro tank uh, definitely made the difference when I added macros... And, and cared for them, you know, made sure they were the ones getting harvested, made sure they were, you know, whatever. Um, it, it did definitely reduce the harmful nuisance algae in the tank. So just a thought. Anyone else? Nicole, do you have a hang on back skimmer at least? Yes, I do. 
good. I'm that I used to do hang on back years ago. That's how I started. And I think the skimmers probably the biggest help. Yeah. Well, the problem is most of the hang on the back skimmers don't perform as well as right. some of the in sump skimmers. So very true. You know, one of the things that may be helpful to you is to add a second hang on the back skimmer. Mm. Um, mm. I, I know that sounds kind of re redundant, but I'd be willing to bet you that the skimmer you have, if you've got a hundred gallon tank, is not performing well enough to take care of the needs. Hey, Dan, can you, uh, would you suggest, because uh, I'm not sure in this particular case, but I know you've helped me, walked me through some problems in my tanks before using peroxide. What are your thoughts about peroxide um, to deal with algae? Or no? Well, the problem is, is that it's very difficult to come up with a schedule and to do it correctly without, you know, you can run into a problem of overdosing the tank and harming the biological filtration um, or you're just not doing it enough and it doesn't, you know, achieve the goal. Uh, peroxide will oxidize organic matter, but you can't, you can't put too much in at one time because it will oxidize the beneficial bacteria. So mm. the proper way to do it would be to one, use what's called an oxi uh, oxidator which is a German made product, which slowly releases peroxide in the water column. And that in turn oxidizes organics. That's a pretty effective and safe way of doing it. The other way is you need a dosing machine and to calculate it out. And you couldn't rely strictly on calculations. You'd have to have test kits to measure the peroxide levels. So, so we just got really complicated. Yeah. Okay. Well, pretty complicated and a real pain in the butt. And I really don't recommend it on the hobbyist level. All right. Well, I I just I know I need a tank upgrade. I know that. And my thing was, I only started in this hobby the beginning of December, so I know I need everything needs to be upgraded. Well, and I and Nicole, what you said when we first started talking about it being a new tank, seriously, like when you've got a new tank and it's so hard with seahorses because you want to make it beautiful for them, but you got to go through the algae cycle, and the more you fight it, the longer it's going to take. So you may still absolutely, yeah, you know, yeah, you might <laughs> still be just have to just kind of deal with it if the seahorses are happy. But I did want to make sure you got an actual answer to because I jumped around. Um, do you no, guys? I did. I did. I well, did. I'm curious, I, darn my, it. My whole thing is I need a tank upgrade. Yeah. That's it. Well, do you, but well, I'm curious if anyone else in the group ha thinks that moving rock around or that kind of thing does disrupt or removing the sand. We talked about having to recompensate, but does that, does making those changes make too much, make it worse? And Dan, I heard you starting to talk. That probably wasn't what you were going to say, but anybody have thoughts on that? Well, Hi. what I was going to. Oh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> sorry. Well, what I was going to say was one of the things you can do without necessarily upgrading the tank itself per se is to get an overflow box and set up a skimmer, I mean, a, a, a sump with an overflow box. And that allows you to do some additional filtration without upgrading the tank. That's actually how I but do mine. what if I just want to upgrade it? Hey, Dan. Can you <laughs> no. describe that to my husband? Nicole wants us, she doesn't want to go fund me, guys. She wants us all to message her husband and say, Nicole needs a new tank. All right. Sorry. Well, tell you, Nicole, I started Perfect. years ago exactly where you're at. I started with um, hang on back, canister filters, all that. I went to a sump. And it's so much better, so much easier. I have a skimmer now in my sump. It's it's designed for a 240 gallon tank, and mine is only 55. Yeah. But it works great. It's you it's so I much easier. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Trust yes, me. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, All right. Lobby for you. All my little oh, tank. Yeah. Are now sumps that I've I reworked and built turned into sumps. Yeah. Dan, yeah. Are you still using your shunted oxidators? I'm sorry. One more time. Are you still using your shunted oxidators? No, uh, they they've pretty much worn out over time. The um, 
the basis of which is some type of uh, iron ferrite material um, have degraded to where I stopped using them. And I still, I never did get set up for distribution like I wanted to. I was bringing them in through somebody else and that all fell apart and it's just gone by the wayside. Yeah, they, they slowly degrade. That's what I found too. So I finally had to stop using the ones that I had. They yep. did seem to make a difference. Yeah, no, I liked them a lot. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, the distribution channel in the United States is not very good. Yeah. Well, the thing is, Tim Ann is the one that sent me the, uh, some of the ones that I got. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You were able to pick them up in Germany. Well, I think I, I do think that uh, Marina and Sam wanted to say something, and they're so soft-spoken, so I'm going to do my loud mouth real quick. I just wanted to point out again that in Dan's presentation, he explained, of course, if you have a new tank, you know, that's a little different. But if you stick to the guidelines, only, you know, a pair of seahorses pour 25 to 30 gallons. And, you know, the guidelines that he set out, typically you'll avoid many of the issues that we're talking about. Setting up filtration right in the first place, not saying anybody here didn't, and not saying we all haven't made mistakes. But, you know, that's why that was such a great presentation, for sure. And uh, Sam or Marina, little soft-spoken gals, did you... Try to say something. Uh, it's a shitty uh, Australian reception in the country where I am. But um, on the, the moving the sand out, if it's siphoned out carefully and not disrupted, it shouldn't be a problem. It's not actually going to put more organics at this stage into your water. Huh? Only if you stir it, it will. So be careful not to stir. Is your... Yeah, just siphon it out. Gotcha. Okay, great. And I wish I was in Australia with you, so don't don't call it <laughs> any. Uh, Marina, were you trying to say? I can, mate. I'm coming to visit someday very soon. I promise. I'm gonna show up on your door. Um, but Marina, did you did we cut you off? Were you trying to say something? Well, um, just before when we were talking about fluconazole and sort of getting rid of algae in your t and it bothering the sea horses. Sometimes it's not actually the fluconazole that's bothering things oh. in the tank. Sometimes it's the change of water chemistry and nit um, nitrate and phosphate in the water because what actually happens when you start using like something like fluconazole and your algae starts dying is it really affects the water quality because um, up until that point, the hair algae or sort of whatever plus algae is actually taking up a lot of the waste and excess nitrogen and phosphate. And although it looks pretty ugly, it's actually helping to keep your water really clean in the same way that an algae scrub or a refugium does. And then when you start to kill that algae and it dies off, especially if you're not um, physically removing as much as you can, it's actually polluting your water. So Interesting. Um, here in here in Australia, I know, or in Melbourne anyway, um, to get to Conazole, we actually have to go to the vet and get a prescription for it. And um, I always say, get a like get enough for a lot more than your water volume because you can buy it online now, Marina. Oh, Sam says oh, you can, can, yeah. I, know, I think Nicole, I'm pretty, oops, bell's going off. Okay, I think um, that Nicole's in U.S., right? And she already had it anyway, so, right. But you don't need to go to the doctor's yes. anymore in Australia. You can buy it online. Gotcha. Oh, good. But, um, yeah, I'd always say have enough that you can replace it as you do a lot of water changes. Right. Because uh, the water just gets dirty. Um. It just gets polluted because what was it sort of um, the same thing as if you just mushed up your coral in your tank and just let it sit there or mushed up the algae and let it sit there. It's a lot of stuff you don't want to be in the tank. No, not exactly because it actually I oxidizes, so it changes the the um, the decaying matter's chemical form to a small extent. So it's not really like just having it all die in the tank Yeah, that would, that would be bad. Yeah, just keep it on your water. 
we value the heck out of our Australian friends and seahorse lover people coming. And I hate, I, I, if I'm cutting you off, I'm so sorry. You're kind of coming in and out. Um, it, and if I, if we ever can't hear you and you have a question, comment, or, you know, I'm talking too loud, type it because I'll see it eventually. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, and I wanted to mention. I the comments, I'll explain it to you on the side. And uh, I can message Marina and explain it on the side, too. The comments are either on Facebook or YouTube or on the actual. You have to be watching it and see the screen. I did want to mention, though, that Dylan Roberts, thank you for joining us tonight, and mentioned that the only way he got rid of diatoms um, is improving nutrient control. I'm, I'm sorry, improving nutrient removal, skimming better, more water changes, and careful feeding. And I'm curious, Dylan, do you keep seahorse tanks? Uh, because careful feeding, you know, is not as exactly as big of an option for us. I mean, we have to feed them so much, so many times, etc. Um, and usually, as Kim mentioned earlier, we overfeed. So we need to watch it. You're not wrong. And I would just be interested in hearing more about how you improve nutrient removal. Because we've talked about using scrubbers, skimmers, uh, macros, etc. What what worked for you? Um, and Kim says your presentation was amazing, Dan. Dylan also asked, in a reef tank, people use nano bubbles to scrub clean reef aquariums. Is it safe to do this with seahorses? I can tell you, I personally have done it um, in a seahorse tank with the help of Cruz Arias. Um, I if, I would be happy to try to link the description of that when we're done. Because uh, he, I'm not even going to attempt to explain the schedule and et cetera and what I had to do to make it work. But, um, Dan, do you think that micro-bubbling in a seahorse tank would be dangerous because of the no. old school thought that bubbles? Mm -mm. No. Bubbles are not what cause gas bubble disease. Exactly. Um, now, what people need to realize is, is that supersaturation of oxygen and water can cause gas bubble disease. And you sometimes see that with other fish. But in a typical tank, there's not enough pressure to supersaturate the water enough. And when we say micro bubbles that cause gas bubble disease, these are microscopic bubbles, not micro in being small bubbles. So being we're talking about air bubbles that are so small you can't see them. And the O2 saturation becomes above what's normally 100% for that given water. So it, most of us don't run high pressure pumps. It takes a high pressure pump leaking air to really super saturate the water enough to cause gas bubble disease. I would have no qualms using bubbles in a seawater tank. Yeah, yeah, bubbles are not a problem. And neither is leaking air. And they love playing in bubbles. Bubbles break. Yep, they sure do. They they'll 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 go and play in them. You aren't joking. Um, Kim, no, the clam doesn't need a mask with your loops. I saw your comment. I do go back and read them, guys. Um, and uh, 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 the salty reef mentioned that the fish seahorse keeper is the most important important part of the filtration. Proper tank maintenance is the key, in his yeah. opinion. Um, don't I don't disagree. But I also will say, especially like when you're on a new tank, like Nicole is, the, the S-H-I-T happens. I guess spelling it's probably not good either. But, and you got to go through the oh, cycling. Feed, what? Feed, 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 feed. That, happened to you. <laughs> that happened to me? It happens to you, not just when you're new. Murphy's law should always happen. Oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah, that stuff always does happen, but especially you can guarantee it when you're new. Um, Dan, uh, and anyone, actually, I shouldn't keep calling on Dan here, but if anybody saw a comment that I missed or a question I missed, if I missed your question in the comments, say it again right now, uh, because I do notice that once we go over an hour, the stream starts getting bumpy and, and uh, you know, cutting all, people off. So I don't want to keep it going too long. But if you have any further questions about filtration or topics you want discussed next week, please feel free to comment or message. And um, I'm going to ask Dan first, is there anything that you feel like we did not get to cover the way we should have regarding filtration? Kelly? Yes. Just tell everybody to call Dan if they have a problem. Well, that's always true. But Dan <laughs> Dan, Dan sometimes can't take all our darn calls. So I try, we try to help too. The group. Seahorse source, 
He's not laughing. You know, I, I always prefer to talk to people directly because when I talk to people directly, I can ask questions, I can isolate, identify what's going on, and then come up with a correct protocol to fix it. It's very difficult on a message board to get yeah. an open-ended question to solve it. Um, I don't disagree. So, I just mean that you've put some, some Cheryl and Lisa and, and admin in charge that, you know, will feel out the problem if it's something small that we can just help with, like how many gallons per tank, you know, how many seahorses per gallon or whatever we can help. Right. And then if it gets too much, we say call Dan. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, sorry. Yeah. I just recently worked with a young guy, um, bought a, an erectus from a local fish store. It wasn't eating. It's a, obviously a very large adult male. Mm -hmm. uh, started floating. And I spotted uh, basically what I felt was internal gas bubble disease mm. up above, well, basically in the area of the swim bladder. Uh, he did everything right. He did exactly what I told him to do. Uh, uh, almost two weeks later, Seahorse is swimming, courting, and eating. Awesome. Nice. You're, you're one of the people one. I go to with, with questions that are out of my league. Hey, really quick, um, I wanted to ask Nicole, are you trying to show us something? I, I even walked him through going to a medical supply house wow. to get the calf to tube feed him. Oh, my. And also, after he started coming around, he had a little bit of gas in his pouch. And he did his per first pouchy back on this seahorse. Wow. But that's one of the, th this guy w was totally dedicated sure. to saving this seahorse. Well, and people like you and Ray, I mean, I, I, if I can't handle it, I send them to you. And if you, you know, if you're whoever, then we go to Dan for sure. But really quickly, well, Nicole, are you showing us something? It, or, no, it's just my fry tank. Oh, well, let's all look it's at my Nicole's fry, fry tank. <laughs> and it, they're, they're minuscule, so you probably can't see them. <laughs> but they're my babe. Aww. I love them. It's kind of. The four that have made it, I was like, every day I wake up and I look and I'm like, wow, four are still there. <laughs> I think I heard, I saw somebody ask you um, in, in on a post, do you put fishing line in for them to hitch to? Yeah, I do. That's what I did. That was the original thing I did, and they still hitch to it. So until they stop, yeah. I will, you know, I'll keep putting in there. I think it's inventive. My yeah. son, my, my oldest son is almost 20, and he's an amazing fisherman. And uh -huh. so I just stole some of his fishing string. <laughs> That he does not use because he uses far more sophisticated stuff than what I, what's in here. He uses that like fancy. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't even know. Right. But he right. uses good not. stuff. I the braided to... the braided line. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Sam. Sam, what'd you say? Braided yes, like braided. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, he it. uses the braided fishing line. Yeah, so I stole his old middle. stuff that he does not use anymore. So Love it. that's what it is. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, but I don't, I definitely want to make sure that we haven't missed any comments or questions. Did any, um, I'm just going to go through the list of you and then we'll, we'll call it for the night. And we'll always be back next week, guys. Just don't want it to get choppy. Holly, did you have anything you wanted to add about filtration or otherwise? No, I'm all good. Thanks. Well, we just love you coming. Cheryl, anything you feel that we, we need to say about filtration, a question you've gotten that we haven't covered? I need to go tough off tanks to get to my last feeding of the night. Well, you go then. We just love when you come. Um, Nicole left us, so she, she, apparently she didn't have any more questions. Sam, was there anything else that uh, we you don't think we touched on about filtration or whatever? Am I the only one? Was that Sam or Dan? I'm sorry, Sam. S. U. <laughs> um, oh, I missed the first half of the show, but um, because of border changes here, I now can't leave my small town. If I was a couple of days away, I still could go to work. 
Um, so being around, I thought I'd say hi and pop on. We, we love having you. And, uh, yeah, I mean, even if you watch later or come in late, if, you, if a question's already been asked and we talk about it later, we don't care. We're, we're Wine Wednesday. Miss Marina, anything? I'm going to you last, Dan, because, you know, you're, you always got something to say. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Miss Marina, is there anything that you don't think we touched on about filtration or did you have anything you wanted to ask or talk about that we haven't covered? I think it was mostly covered, yeah. Good. Oh, I've got a question from Marina. Go ahead, Sam. Yes. How's steak for lockdown, mate? Oh, Sam, it's horrible. <laughs> it, it's awful. <laughs> oh, it's coming here soon enough. Also, um, I don't know if you know <laughs> Melbourne. Um, we're currently in stage four lockdown. Um, yeah, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> no, it's really bad. We're not even meant to... Um, be more than five kilometers away from our house wow. even like if you're going, even going for like a walk or a bike ride you're not meant to be sort of your five kilometer radius jeez yeah. i'm feeling like we could we need to and could do an entire show on this but i want to make sure ray's here because he's going to argue with all y'all <laughs> he thinks we need to lock down anyways yeah no i oh, totally no, feel I can't, I can't i can't get my fish shop anymore. Yeah. I could cross the border and now I'm two Ks too far south to be able to cross the border anymore. So and no one ships frozen foods and stuff. Crap. I hear you. And, and well I've already had it. Yeah, that's why I've said Oh wait, what does your shirt say, Dan? I want to go back. <laughs> Hang it on. says COVID. Been there, done that. Hang on, I want to get a close up oh, of your shirt. It's um, yeah, it's it's quite extreme, and there's really big fines if you get caught sort of out when you're not allowed to be out, and there's a government-imposed curfew. But um, actually, one of the shops that I go to that keep a lot of seahorses um that keep a lot of seahorses um had to close for a while because mm. I guess it wasn't worthwhile them being because people couldn't get to them. So I've actually got um for the next couple of weeks there are 20 seahorses that are my foster babies as well oh is my gosh where brett works? is that where brett works yes yeah they're opening back up but um they're also more than five kilometers away so it's an issue of me getting there to give them back as well mm. Yeah, yeah. It's still it's still a real hats off, really. Uh, wow, that they trust you know have enough faith in your care to leave the seahorses with you. Congrats, and you know what a nice and wonderful thing for you to do because it's not easy for sure. Um, I, I, I I feel for you guys. My kids are giving me the signs, guys. I'm sorry, but I I totally feel for you guys, and uh, I'm frankly being selfishly hoping we don't go into straight crazy lockdown again because. You know, while it, well, we'll have, we'll, we're going to have to dig into this in more detail about, you know, your thoughts on, <laughs> obviously people feel differently about it, but I, I just want to. Yeah, I'm going broke. I'm going broke. I've got no work. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. But we all feel your pain. We do. But I, I, I'm, I'm so not trying to cut you guys off because I actually care about what you're talking about. But since it's catching up and my kids are giving me that, um, Dan, did Anything about filtration or anything else that we were talking about tonight that you don't think we touched on or need to say? Or any thoughts, questions? No, not on that. In regards to my shirt, I wore it today <laughs> going to the VA, and um, it was hilarious. Um, and I've worn it a couple times. I went to the health food store wearing this shirt, and one of the, the workers there, I was looking at uh, some CBD oil and some other stuff, and she came up to me. She said, does that mean that you've already had it? And I said, yes. And she said, really and next thing you know there's like six employees standing around in a circle firing <laughs> questions at me because they this this is a health food store and it, they said i was the first customer that said they had had it mm. and mm. you know i find it so shocking because the amount of people that i come in contact with that don't know anything about having covid um and we're supposed to have such high numbers here in florida there was a whole community behind us that uh, was supposed to be, go get tested, and the testing got canceled for some reason. 
all of them received a letter stating that they tested positive and they were never tested. There's so many problems with how the counting is done. It's just crazy. But my question was that I had was, am I the only one drinking tonight? I don't see anybody else drinking. I always got no, the I wine. Drink. Yeah. What you drinking, Holly? I just drink. Wait, wait. Every, every, hang you? on. Holly, what? I Bacardi and Coke. Yeah. And Sam? <laughs> I, I forgot. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning there for you guys, right? So you're like uh, orange juice. Oh, I don't know something. It's not midday yet. It's midday somewhere in the world. So, hey, I should just be there. Five o'clock somewhere. You started. For me, it's perfect. <laughs> you know, I couldn't decide tonight, so I decided to be pro-choice. So, I'm all right. <laughs> And he still gave us such an awesome, he gave us such an awesome presentation too. Listen, guys, what I'm going to do, uh, one of the benefits of coming to the Wine Wednesday room on Wednesday is that, you know, it's, I don't end it right away. So if you're still in here after I stop the stream, we can continue chatting and you can always join later. But thank you to everyone who came. I'm going to let everybody say goodbye. And we will, of course, be back again next week. New topic will be announced by the weekend. And if you have any suggestions, thoughts, or questions, comment sections always open. If I miss your comment, I apologize. I'll, I'll come back to it. All right, you guys say bye, and I'm going to do my empty glass. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Nope. I was going to say. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Happy Wine Wednesday.